Welcome to another episode of the Abdullah Samir Show with your friendly neighborhood ex-Muslim. And I'm joined by the Walk Nation guys. Soda, how do I say it? Soda Wow? Soda Wow. So the whoa, so the whoa. Oh my god. <laughs> so that oh means that uh, greetings, well, right? The language. That means welcome. Hey. Welcome? Welcome, yeah. Well, I guess you guys say marhaban as well. Is that yeah. common? Uh, but I guess sometimes, but not really. Okay. So, so I'm by... Somalis, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm joined by two ex Muslim Somalis, which is amazing. And we're going to be talking about. I was going to talk about atheism in Somalia, but then Khan, no, new nomad, told me, oh, that's a little bit too aggressive. Let's just talk about apostasy first, uh, okay. because apparently there's a lot of apostates that are also Christian, and they have this lot of things going around, going on that topic as well. So I want to get started. First, before, we actually, before I actually ask you guys about yourselves, what does WAK mean? You're, you're the hosts of WAK Nation. What is WAK? Um, do you want to tell them? Um, yeah, yeah, I could definitely uh, break that down. Well, pre-Islamic uh, Somalis believe in uh, a sky god, right? And that isn't just for Somalis, but um, most Cushitic people. Like you have the Oromos, the Afars, the Behas. Like so, a lot of um, uh, and some people actually still practice it to this day in the in the Horn of Africa. Oh, yeah. So Wak is literally sky god. A, you know, so that's that's who was the deity that was worshipped, if you will. Uh, pre-Islamically in in the Somali um, setting. Ah, so, but you guys are not actually worshippers of Wak. You're taking the piss, so to speak, right? <laughs> this sort of right, right. So but speak. you know, I, I was just going to say, like, even though, um, you know, Somali is like 100% Muslim country now, they still incorporate, like, um, Wak is still incorporated somehow in the culture. So mm -hmm. uh, collectively, the Somali memory has forgotten, like, the Wak religion or worship of Wak. But then, you know, linguistically uh, wak still um exists in the language so you know they you know there's a common word they use for paradise it's called barwako so it means rain from wak the, the actual word means rain from wak oh, so really. rain from the sky god so yeah so it's just a play on words obviously we weren't going to call ourselves you know honestly i i kind of got waked nation from the play of you know how you know you're supposed to be one nation under allah and which obviously we're no longer a part of so I guess, you know, it was just um, symbolic of the fact that, you know, Somalis, we don't really have an identity outside of Islam. Well, that's what Somali Muslims will say. Shout out to the haters. Um, <laughs> but that's what they will say, um, that we don't really have an out outside identity outside of Islam. So Waq Nation was kind of like a play on that. Like, actually, we do. And um, we were once upon a time one nation under Waq. So, you know. Nice, nice. Yeah. So, uh, so new nomad Khan. Let's talk. Let's start with you, um, okay. because you are on time. <laughs> 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 let's talk, let's start with you. Tell Leave us, the Australians alone. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about how how you ended up atheist. Well, like, so, like Somalis, I always hear Somalis are hundred percent Muslim. So you must be Muslim. Like you can't be atheist. Sure, how did, how did you become atheist? Like what happened? Um, and 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 honestly, I wouldn't even. Uh, because the thing is, okay, so let me just take it back a little bit. What happened was many years ago, I had a friend of mine who was a um, Bible right? I'm he sorry. Was, uh, he was, the, I, I had a, many years ago, I had a friend of mine who was a Bible thumper. Essentially. Oh, yeah. He was a, mm -hmm. he was a Christian dude um, from, uh, from the east coast of uh, Canada. And uh, he was really, really into it. And, you know, so we would have these debates. We would have these really uh, full-on debate, and you have to understand, like in the mind of a, you know, me being a Muslim, um, of course Islam is the truth, right? Of course, this is the only way. What are you talking about? You guys are just biding your time before you actually see the truth. <laughs> That's the mindset, right? So I went on and uh, tried to uh, prove him wrong because we would have these actual debates. Turns out he knew the scriptures uh, <laughs> a little bit better than me. So what I had to do was I was forced to kind of go back and read the scriptures and actually read the Quran and read some of these hadiths. And what I, I, I still have my, I remember reading through the Quran, find, trying to find nice passages to kind of give them a, you know, get a gotcha moment and see how much better Islam is type of thing. What happened is we would do this and we did this throughout like a, like a couple of years, I would say, honestly. 
But then one day I kind of went back to my Quran and to see where the highlighted stuff was. And I realized it was very few and far in between. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so honestly, I kind of, what I realized is that as a Muslim, you kind of take it as a culture more, more so than actually any kind of spirituality because it, everything is so dictated in Islam. You know, you do this, you do that, you do this. And even the ones that don't do it believe that that's what they should be doing. Right. And, and, and that is the lock, uh, the locked in mentality um, that Islam offers, in, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So essentially, I went back to uh, my, uh, my, my my Quran and I looked at, you know, and I actually read it for the first time with a critical eye, as opposed to an already believing eye. Right. I wasn't bought in anymore. I was just kind of reading it with a little bit more uh, criticism because I found myself kind of seeding way and saying, yeah, you're right, because he would bring up all of the harsh things that we would either bypass or not talk about or 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 sweep under the rug in, in essence right and he would bring them up because he obviously didn't have the same respect for islam that i did so he would bring those things up and i would be in a position where i had to deal with it whether it was in a good way or a bad way but so i had a decision to make at one point and the decision was are you going to be sincere or do you just want to one up him right and that's actually an um uh, a conversation that I had internally. And I came out of it saying, well, if you're not sincere, then what's the point of all this? Then you're just lying and it's not it's not genuine, right? Mm-hmm. So I didn't go around saying that I had the genuine thing if I wasn't gonna be genuine in the way I approached the debate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That being said, um, it very quickly became obvious that uh, Islam wasn't was what I was thought. Uh, now, now, bear in mind, it takes time, but I mean, it, it was a bit, it was a bit of a shocker because that was everything I've always believed in. Um, it was a part of our routine. It was a part of everything, and that's when I kind of started then trying to separate uh, culture from religion. Uh, so that's that's kind of been my pathway, just to kind of give you a bit of an overview. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, it reminds me of a joke that we have as developers. Um, this. I code in a language called JavaScript. So there's a book called JavaScript mm-hmm. and there's a big fat book. And then there's a much smaller book called JavaScript, the good parts. And it's like a tiny <laughs> little book. So if you did the same thing with the Quran, you have like the Quran <laughs> and then you have the Quran. The good you have <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so Noon, uh, do you want to tell us about yourself and does your story mirror what happened with Khan or is it different? Like how, what happened with you? I I was going to say, you know, obviously I'm a woman, so I think my story is completely different. I I think just before you introduced me as an activist and, you know, I've said this so many times, I actually don't identify as an activist um, at all. I just identify as an individual who chose to leave Islam that happened to garner a lot of attention from my community, thanks to honour and shame culture. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But really, um, you know, okay, you know, for me... you know what I'm guilty of? Probably being a little naive about internet culture. Just not being a cool millennial. So what had happened with me was around 2017, I joined Twitter. I just, like, prior to that, I had, I guess I used Facebook on and off, but I wasn't really somebody that was huge on social media, yeah? So, again, I'm guilty of being kind of naive to internet culture because I had no um, way of anticipating that me slandering Islam, minding my own business. I was just thinking, I'm just this little old Somali girl, <laughs> random Somali girl from Australia. Who's gonna care? You know, I'm just slandering the prophet. You know, yeah. Islam. You know, you know. Oh, they they call it slandering, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not, not, it's not it slander. I mean, it's my it's, truth. It's, it's an opinion, truth, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, it's um, exactly. And I, you know, honest to God, I've seen all these ex-Muslims, so I was so excited because I've never seen, um, you know people like us talk about and uh, you know I, the tweets that I was seeing were so inflammatory but I loved it you know because I was just like oh my god I've never seen anybody talk about the things that I had in my head for years um so this is how I came out so I mean look as a woman like to be honest with you, I had friction with Islam all my life you know I, I started learning the Quran at four years old um I went to Islamic school started going to Islamic school at four I actually, I gotta be honest with you, when I was young, I was not one of these people that had a struggle learning the Quran. Learn Arabic was easy for me. The Quran was like easy, like memorization. Like, so I wasn't really abused in madrasa and stuff like that. That wasn't my memories. My memories actually were 
it actually kind of built my confidence because I was like, oh my God, I can I can memorize this other language. So, you know what I mean? I was really good at it. Was, was, but, that, um, sorry, was that in Australia or in Somalia? In Australia, in Australia, oh, yeah. It's okay. only now in hindsight that I look back at my education and realize that I was stunted um, because I had spent so much time in my youth memorizing the Quran that I did not spend any time on, you know, science, you know, maths, like, you know, I mean, I'm, I didn't learn evolution as a child because I went to Islamic school. So it was up until I was 13, I didn't have a proper, I'd say, English science um, education until I went to a secular school. Um, mm -hmm. And I had, to, had a lot of catching up to do. But like I said, my journey, I feel like as a woman, as an ex-Muslim woman, is so different from your guys as, as men, you mm -hmm. know, because we have this constant friction with Islam, you know, so, as a girl, from the time you're six years old, you're um, con uh, cognizant of Aisha marrying the, prof the prophet. So there's always this kind of, as a uh, Muslim girl, your childhood is cut short from that six-year-old point. Aisha didn't have a childhood, so don't you. You know what I mean? So that's how, so yeah, I, can I guess you be, my journey out of this time. Can you be more specific? Like what, like give some details, like what do you mean by that? Like when you said your, oh. your childhood was cut short by this, by Islam. So you you did already mention some of it. So you know, obviously, you were not. There was more focus on this religious aspect. Were you not? Were you in Islamic school? So did you do secular stuff as well? And but you spent more time on Quran. Like what happened there? I mean, yeah, we did. Um, we did have like other subjects that were mandatory, obviously, in Australian school. But honestly, this particular school got away with a lot because it was <laughs> the first Islamic school um, of its kind. So the Australian government had no. They didn't actually check on us. They used to beat us you know, right. at school, oh. you know, my mom used to pay them. It was a private school. So we used to get paid to be assaulted and abused. Um, so, but I was good at avoiding the beatings because I would actually do the work. Oh yeah. Um, you know, but you know, it was like when I say my childhood was cut short, I mean, you know, for us, we were taught to be wives from six years old. I was constantly taught about marriage, like to the point where I remember being nine years old and I remember being a young child and having suicidal ideation. You know how Armin Navabi talks about him trying to jump off a building because he wanted to stay a child, because he wanted to go to heaven? I yeah. had exactly that mentality as a child. Like, I wow. loved Islam. I thought, I like, I loved the prophet. I, I, I thought him marrying a child was amazing. I thought um, dying as a child would be incredible because that's a guaranteed ticket to heaven. I just never wanted to hit puberty. So, wow. like, now when I look back, I feel so sad for myself, how yeah. much I was brainwashed, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. Oh, I was just wow. really, I was like a seven-year-old seven, seven year old Palestinian activist. I remember the way I used to hate <laughs> Jews. I never met a Jew in my life, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I was born and raised in Australia, imagine. All I used to talk about as a seven-year-old was, like, Israel. Like, I didn't know about evolution. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. about Australian history, even. You know what I mean? I didn't yeah. know so many things, but I just knew Israel was to blame for everything. Palestine needed to be free. I even knew the names of Martin. <laughs> I didn't know evolution, though. You know. Yeah. Wow, yeah. it reminds me of uh, what Hassan Radwan said. Um, Hassan Radwan has a video where he says that um, you know, when you become Muslim, you 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 have all of these things that you're assumed to have to pick up on as well. So you automatically, you know, Kashmir becomes an issue, yeah. uh, Palestine Kashmir. and yeah like all of these things suddenly you know um become a big issue not not become a big issue you become part of your identity even though they have you have nothing mm -hmm. to do with them mm -hmm. um which is weird right but i mean that's that's kind of part and parcel with the whole islamic ideology and this is why i mean it's a little bit dangerous too because you have these people that are in america and the uk and everywhere and suddenly you know, out of nowhere, you have these people wanting to join ISIS, and I mean, that's the kind of extreme example. Well, of that's, I think that's what the um, the whole concept of the Ummah is, right? Yeah. I often tell my um, uh, my Somali people that, but, and I, and I, I think we're going to touch up on that later. But there is a, a specific um, way that we always kind of value. We we take on all of the plight of all of these different Muslims. Mm -hmm. Simply because we sh we have that shared identity. In the Somali thing, so. yeah, the thing, however, there's not really any <laughs> actual action that is done. It's just the hatred <laughs> that really resides within you, as for why these things are happening the way they're happening. And I think that's the, the that's the unhealthy part, in my in my opinion. 
And I was telling uh, my uh, Somali people, I'm like, it's funny that when we speak of the Ummah, we'll, ta- we'll talk about the Palestinian plight, we'll talk about the other plights, but never about the Somali plight. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it, it, there is that certain, I believe, there is a certain Arab supremacy within Islam, right? And 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 then I'm sure we can talk about that uh, at length. But why does it, it only matters when it happens in specific parts of the world. A Somali dying every day because they don't have proper water. They don't have, uh, they, you know, they're under the uh, the knees of um, Al Shabaab, for example. There's all these things. Gaza happen- is better than Somalia. I swear to God, Gaza is better than Mogadishu. And that's what offends me so much. <laughs> we it. hear constantly about Gaza. Nobody talks about Mogadishu burning for the last seven, you know, twenty-eight years. Well, I care anyway. Yeah. Just in case, hmm. you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's um yeah, definitely we want to raise awareness about our own pl- uh places that we're from, which is you know, I think a little bit of nationalism is a good thing because it allows us to mm-hmm. to care about people that we're otherwise not related to, right? In a way that you you know, when you when you live in a society, you're paying taxes and you're actually paying taxes for someone else to benefit mm-hmm. from in a way that you don't personally benefit necessarily, right? So it's the idea of working together. Obviously, too much nationalism is bad. Now, the problem with Islam is, you know, it it puts a bunch of other stuff in there that uh, have nothing to do with you. And, you know, and and the problem is it makes the whole Palestinian-Israel thing just so much worse, too. It's just the religion, you know, equation just makes it worse. And in Somalia, does the religion make, you know, co co uh, like tolerance and you know co-living does it make it more difficult living Absolutely. with christians and muslims and can we Absolutely. talk about that yeah yeah i feel as though like for me it's not about nationalism for me i'm like the least nationalistic person in the world like i, I like i guess i do identify as an australian i will admit um but for me when it comes to somalia somalia people are dying of extremely preventable um things you know like you know there's preventable even preventable violence you know like um i just feel like as um somebody who's privileged to be in the west of a somali background for me like i'm not going to be sitting here advocating for gaza all day when i come from war-torn mogadishu you know where they're blowing each other up you know so i think people you know black lives really do matter to me not in this kind of superficial way like we talk about in the west where it's only a specific kind of black life we talk about but for me you know um, it's not about nationalism. It's just about Somalia is the, the literally the worst country in the world for human beings. Mm. So it's just a human rights issue. So yeah. And and like you know, like you said, when even in Australia, you were putting more energy. Actually, your parents put more energy into Quran over, you know, mm-hmm. things that actually matter. Isn't that part Absolutely. of the problem for Somalia as well, where everybody mm-hmm. is putting so much energy into the religion? And it actually makes you fall behind, isn't that? Isn't that? The, would you agree with that? You know, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say in my parents' defense because I feel that my parents migrated. So my parents came from Somalia as skilled migrants in the '80s. You know, in the so in the '90s there wasn't there was no black people in Australia. There was no. Um, I mean, there was obviously indigenous, but it's a different. You know, it's a 97 percent white. Um, I think Australia is a very tough society to integrate into. Don't get it twisted. Like I love Australia and I, and I do my best to integrate, but I think it was very. Ch- I think my parents made the right decision, um, with kind of pushing us with the Islamic community. So there was already an existing Arab Turkish community. So I think for my family, my parents were just like, okay, close enough. You know, let's keep my kids around. Keep my kids around the Desis, around the Arabs, Turks, or whatever. I mean, did we experience racism? Absolutely. Did, were we radicalized? Of course. Like I said, I was a Palestinian activist. But that saying, I, I feel like it, my sense of confidence and well-being overall, I mean, I like I don't have this kind of chip on my shoulder about being black um, that I may have had I gone to like all white schools, do you know? Mm. Um, yeah. So I, I, like in my parents, I, I wouldn't take my daughter to an Islamic school now you know, given that Australia is much more multicultural, but I'm saying at the time, I don't, in hindsight, like, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand what my parents' thought process was at the time, you know. I wanted to add, um, uh, Abdullah, that um, we've got to be also uh, confident. This, uh, Sorry, you cut this out. Can also you just repeat that again? Sorry, right. you, got, you got cut off. Can you repeat that again? Yeah, so we have to kind of be- can you hear me now? Can yeah. You hear me? Yeah. Sorry, it was just, it was, it was okay. going robot robot voice for a second. Go ahead. 
Okay, I'm an Android, sorry. Um, so it, we have to be cognizant that this also happens uh, within a context, um, at least in the Somali setting. I personally, myself, I was born in uh, Djibouti, which is a lot more, um, I would say, liberal in terms of the way religiosity is lived. It's a lot more liberal in a lot of ways. But within the, like, let's say uh, in Somalia, what has happened is religiosity became sort of like um, the fallback plan after the war happened because there was a lot of funding that was coming from the, the, the Arabic Hejaz, right? <laughs> the, the Saudi Arabia. And all of that, they were importing not only money, but they were also importing um, a certain mentality, a certain depth to religiosity, right? So that's why you got you start seeing um, uh, the shadors and the the, the big uh, niqabs and all of that because Somalis, at some level, I believe it's my personal opinion. I believe felt like they they made Allah mad. And so that because they feel like they've strayed away from the path of Islam, and that's why all this BS was happening in their country. So them reverting back to Islam was going to somehow maybe correct it. 30 years later, I, I don't see any difference, right? I mean, there's been a lot of difference, I, to be fair, but I just don't see any uh, uh, progress the way I like it to see. Um, I was just going to add in there the, the backlash against Sufism because I think devil's advocate here, and I know it's going to sound crazy, but I think in Somalia's defense, because Somalia used to be a Sufi country, right? So my tribe, particularly in Somalia, is super Sufi. So we, when, I, when I talk about Sufi, I don't know how to describe this to your listeners, but um, let me just say they are kind of like, uh, you know, very mystical, but they very, what I'm, okay, this is not politically correct, but they make things up as they go. Sufis, they really do. So my tribe and my family are very, they do the Molid, you know, they're constantly throwing holy water on each other. They dance mm -hmm. around. It's a, it's a little interesting. I'm not going to lie. They, they sing <laughs> it's and dance. Fun, isn't it? It's a little, little scary sometimes. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. So, um, you know, so my family is from that world, right? So what I've found out, so, um, because my grandfathers are all chefs, Sufi chefs, right? Um, so I found out when I visited London about 10 years ago, um, that um, to my horror and shock that um, some of my grandparents, my great grandfathers weren't that um, honorable, had, didn't have a lot of integrity in that they would kind of make things up as they go and, and make use of, uh, like, sorry, take, uh, uh, take advantage of the fact that Somalis don't speak Arabic. Oh. There's only a few Somalis speak Arabic, you know, and understood the Quran. So mm -hmm. my, my tribe were kind of like learned people. So they would make things up as they go, you know what I mean? And it's a, they'd be like, yeah, this is, you know, um, so anyways, I said all this to say, basically, Salafism, if you look at Salafism and the Wahhabis, what they're offering is a very black and white, literal, do-it-yourself kind of version of Islam. You yeah. know, nobody, here's the rules, very clear, nobody can change them, there's no chef that's going to come out, do you know what I'm saying? And so it's very attractive to a people who have been scammed effectively by people like mm, my family, yeah. unfortunately, you know what I mean? So it's very attractive when you're being told you know, by like um, essentially a wizard is making up <laughs> things as he goes for years and years, and that's the culture yeah. that you're from, you know, that you finally got the hard and fast rule book. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So I feel like that's why Somalis, it wasn't just like the civil war, it was like the civil war, we had secularism beforehand, so they were like, then then we had this version of Islam that we had was like very, like I said, very airy-fairy, um, make up as you go. So when Wahhabism came after the Civil War, it looked very attractive, makes sense. Do you get what I'm saying? All I gotta do is wear a tent, you know, all of, my man's gotta grow his beard out and we're all off to heaven. You know, it's very simple. What's, uh, what's the mixture of the population now that are Salafi? Because most of the Somalis I know are Salafi. I don't know any Sufi Somalis. Like the masjid, the-, so the All the our big... grandparents are. Yeah, okay. that's, uh, that's, uh, that's generations yeah. past. Like I can honestly tell yeah. you, that I've been told stories of my uncles doing an actual Islamic ceremony for the death of Bob Marley. <laughs> no joke. So you can tell. Like, it, I'm laughing were... because obviously, yeah. like the Islam I was taught, that's not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, but that's the kind of Islam of my family. Allowed, but... That's the kind of. Oh, kind wow. Of hmm. You know, that's how they were. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, kind of. You know, there's a lot of music, a lot of dancing. Like I said, like because a you lot have to of great areas. We have, we have, 
we had rituals, right, to yeah. to kind of uh, uh, to, to to give honor, to praise uh, the people that we love, that we lost, and all of that, right? Because we were human. Oh, what yeah. do you think they did? We well exactly. Yeah, so yeah. what they did when Islam came is not that they got rid of them; they just put it under the guise of Islam. So you still doing the same thing. I think there's something that's done when the woman is pregnant, and before it used to praise um, a, a Somali goddess, but now it praises <laughs> Fatima, which is uh, the the prophet's daughter. Yeah, yeah. So they just change yeah. exactly. They change the facade of it into an Islamic facade, but they uh, they would be doing their thing anyway. Do you do you think even with and there's the a lot of resentment as well. There's mm -hmm. like a lot of um, resentment against Sufis as well. So my grandfather, um, so my mum's dad, like, so my, it's my mum's dad's dad that is the big kind of famous chef. So, but my mum's dad, which is my grandfather, um, wasn't necessarily a chef, but he was like in the agricultural ministry and he was a writer and stuff like that. So anyways, he was an elder and he got killed um, in Black Hawk Down, like in a bombing, pretty terribly, whatever. So um, obviously they built him a grave or whatever to honour him and stuff. And um, in 2010, Al Shabaab attacked that. They bombed it to wow. the ground. And mm -hmm. the, the idea behind bombing it was because his father, people go and make pilgrimage to his father's grave and like kind of pray over and stuff like that. So they're constantly destroying, like, I don't think I even can go to, to see my any of my ancestors' graves. They'll probably be destroyed. And they'll make a point of it because mm -hmm. of this concept of worship and stuff like that. They act, there's, people, there's Sufis that will go to pilgrimages for those um, sheikhs rather than go to hajj mm -hmm. there's a hadith you know so, so this this survivalism this is wahhabism right here where they that basically based on these hadith they're destroying graves right right yeah. exactly yeah and, and this pretty is, much what isis does yeah yeah yeah, yeah this is uh it's just a step away from that right um, the bab has also done the same because yeah. we actually do have a lot uh, throughout the Horn of Africa, we have a lot of uh, tombs of of the forefathers. Oh yeah, and it, it might be under the guise of Sheikh whatever, Sheikh this and Sheikh that, but it's really he's the head of the, of, of a family, uh, this and that. And Al Shabab actually, I believe, um, they had taken a campaign where they destroyed a lot, a lot of these, and these are remnants of history that they're destroying, right? Yeah. Right. And you don't tend to find so this is a kind of weird dynamic I, I always find this interesting because i was salafi myself and i know that salafism like official salafism like by the book salafism is against terrorism is against killing of innocents mm -hmm. and all these things mm -hmm. but yet all of the terrorists are salafi not all of them but like the vast majority I, of them they tend to be salafis and they're, they're the ones that they go from this peaceful salafism to yeah. jihadi salafism you don't tend to find like sufis becoming i mean it's it's possible but it's, it's not very that. possible with sufis yeah but you know that's my line that's my line i always say you know um, not all muslims um are terrorists but all terrorists are salafis <laughs> <laughs> well to uh, include a lot all, of all, them, all of them are salafis yeah, no, they are, but I'm saying, you know, in the Muslim, in the Islamic yeah, context, yeah, like, yeah. But that, that being said, I, I have to say, from a Sufi background, like, Sufis can be really crazy. I feel like, <laughs> especially Westerners, people, people are like, oh my God, it's so wonderful you're a Sufi. Like, they're like, Rumi. I'm like, yeah, Rumi was nuts. These people are crazy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> they really are. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's just, it's a really, you know, that oriental view of Sufism as if it's this kind of great mystical thing when it's, it's really exploitative when you look at it, how yeah. it manifests itself. Yeah. So do you think Sufi Islam needs to go away? Like, I mean, you guys are both oh, atheists. Absolutely. I, okay. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you want to reach the promised land. I, I'm not going to reach the well, promised land. Well, you know what? When you, the thing is, um, okay, I'll say this. Just to uh -huh. be clear, I'll say this. I think Sufism has a, a lot of playfulness to it. But when you actually go deep dive into it, it's still Islam. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, it still is Islam. It still has that codex. It still has those uh, pre misogyny and yeah, it still has all yeah. those things built in. And so, I think, I think what Noon is kind of hinting to is a wall like um, with Sufism. There's a lot of you know pe people taking advantage. There's a wall murid and and sheikh and yeah. sheikh can kind of say whatever he wants, and he becomes a like a master with all these people, and he tells them to do this and do that, and they just have to do it because the. Uh, like he, it's a test right like i remember bilal phillips i was salafi myself and he was talking about how some of these sufis i hate that man 
They will. They That's will. That's Noon's favorite chair, by the way. <laughs> That's her favorite chair. <laughs> she oh, hate, you hate Bob Phillips. Phillips. <laughs> oh, my, even as a Muslim, I hated him. I just feel like he's so because he's a black chef as well too. I really can't stand that man. Yeah, I can't stand him. He go and go. Um, <laughs> but but he made a good point. He was saying that like it, you know, there's this blind obedience that they teach you that okay, I'm gonna teach you not to have ego. Mm -hmm. And then, right. well, how do you teach me not to have ego? Well, you, I'm going to make you clean up after me, give me food, you know, do all. The, and sometimes it's even sexual exploitation too, right? Of course. Right, right. It doesn't stop well, at. They say like, give my firstborn child. They give my, um, what I heard was with my, what my grandfather used to do was they literally used to take people's firstborn child. People would feel compelled to give them their first, like to be a house slave in their house. Right. You know? Like, oh, wow. And I'm like, what? So, so the resentment is real because people are just like, you know, I was trying to, you know, learn from your grandfather and he took my firstborn child as a <laughs> slave. There you go. There you go. And, um, you know, this whole thing about trust and, you know, how, and by the way, thank you to William for the donation. When you trust someone, whether it's, um, you know, like, a, like, you know, like not just, not just the imams, but like when you have any sort of, person that you trust especially like a religious leader whether it's a pastor or the imam or the sufi mm -hmm. sheikh and you're leaving your kids with him it, it becomes hard for you to see when there's abuse because yeah. you you know what i mean like it's it's some human flaw that we have that we well it we becomes have. personality worship right it becomes yeah. very quickly it becomes a personality worship and i think a lot of these chefs and you can see videos right now because we're living in the 21st century they, even all of the crevices of, 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 of uh, the darkness of humanity are filmed today, right? So we can see people. We, there's a chef, right? In, 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 uh, I'm not sure where he is in Somalia, but he's in Somalia. His whole thing is that he reads Quran on a barrel of water and he sprays a whole bunch of people with the water. Okay. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, yeah. Most of the people yeah. there are women, right? The most yeah. of the people there are women in niqabs in full, right? And he's spraying them with water. Um, yeah. Literally suit competition. Water. yeah, and pay, people actually pay money, and, and and these are people that are already not you know the most financially yeah. set people. So he's taking money from needy mothers instead of that going to their kids. He's taking that money and he's spraying them with water, so they go in completely dry and come out wet, and they paid some money. That's the I, whole thing. That's and, and so the Rick, the level of ridiculous needs to be kind of called out at some level, right? If not but for what, what, uh, what? religiosity, then th this money can easily go to these kids that you have that you need to feed, right? It's just a more and practical approach. At the very least, that's that's part of it. I mean, worse than that is just like, they think that this is actually going to solve some some problems. Like, let's say they have, you know, some sort of mental issue. Um, you know, like, it could be schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a very mm -hmm. real issue some people suffer from, where they hear things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. nothing there and sometimes they even know there's nothing there but they're still hearing it um there's one there's one ted talk of a woman that says she sees a clown in the corner of her vision everywhere mm -hmm. she goes and these tend to be scary images they're not like smiling clowns they're like scary yeah. clowns or whatever yeah. you know, sometimes the voices are telling you like you're an idiot you're a fool i know one guy who has an has um mm. mental health issues in his family his mom was his mom was, you know, institutionalized and he has issues too. And it got triggered from some stress in his life. And he was saying people were, he was hearing, you're stupid. You're an, like, it was some, it was bad things he was hearing. So can you imagine you're in a culture where you're told jinns is real and you're yeah, hearing, exactly. what yeah. are you going to exactly. think? You're going to think I have a mental exactly. disorder. And you know, the funny thing and is you, you take anti-psychotic drugs and these, these jinns go away. <laughs> right. Sweet. Yeah. And that here, therein lies you re the crux of a huge problem that's happening in the diaspora and in Somalia. So now we have a race, I think, of somewhere where it's somewhere ridiculous, like something at least over 70 to 80 percent PTSD rate. Because obviously we've had a civil war and subsequent um, bombings. We have a culture of bombings. People are literally dying every week to the point of there's an apathy when it comes to violence. Do you get what I'm saying? Because people, and I, I feel as though the Somali community has got such uh, trauma levels. Like, I honestly, I've, I've received a lot of abuse and threats and violence since being, um, obviously, coming out on Twitter. Shout out to all those people. I'm not mad at you at all. I'm just saying, because I, I, I'm not mad at them because 
I feel that we come from a community that's really traumatized. Violence is normal to us. Um, as you said, you know, a lot of these people do have schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is huge in my family. Like I've got several family members, um, unfortunately, that are really unwell. Um, and absolutely, and, and the challenge of getting them on medication is, you know, we get them on antipsychotic medication. Then what happens is obviously the voices stop, um, the delusions stop. And but they, they attribute that to du'a and prayer, you know. Um, so it's like a so you know, cycle. You have people in your family that had this yeah, exact yeah, yeah, issue yeah. and they took anti-psychotic exactly. drugs and it solved the gin problem? Exactly. Wow. Exactly. This is the story of my life. Like literally, but, I know that many people um, that, yeah, it's, it's really common. But, but they also, so if they, they also did the du'a, as long as the, they don't stop the drugs, like they can do du'a. Yeah, the care. problem like, is, is they don't have insight. The problem is with most of the um, most of the uh, mental health um, issue, like schizophrenia. You know, when you talk about personality disorders, you know, when they're in manic state of bipolar and stuff, these people they don't have insight into the thing. So insight is like knowing that you ha that you're unwell, knowing that you're sick. Yeah. That barrier and that barrier, by the way, um, so insight can be blocked by you know, like so so things like stigma can stop obviously people getting help because they obviously stigmatize themselves. They don't want to be labeled um but like there's just so many things that go into it and then religion for me is the worst um aspect of it so for me the reason what i've seen is religion it just has become the thing that has stopped people from getting help in my community and i'm talking like put it this way it's so common um like i go to the psych ward on, honestly i'm there like every month like put it this way all the mental health people in melbourne know me because um, I'm obviously visiting, always visiting family members, and I've got several family members I'm I'm a carer for. Um, whenever I go there, I have this heartbreaking moment. I look around and I see other Somali women with jilbabs. I'm talking about women, six, seven children, uh, because they've been abandoned by men who married other women back home in Somali. We've got this, like, we've got huge problems. Um, Islam is is like you know, Jesus. for me, exacerbating the problems and yeah. and stopping us from talking about them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you were going to say something, Khan? Yeah, it's, it, Islam, um, just to carry on what uh, Nuno was saying, Islam is often used as a justification because, you know, leaving someone, going somewhere else, marrying two, three other women, having their, you know, other families, that is that can easily be justified and explained away. And mm -hmm. it doesn't Anything matter how you feel about it because if you bought in, then you have to submit. That's what Islam stands for, submission, right? So you've got to submit to whatever, however you disagree with it, it doesn't matter. It's not about you, it's about the word of God. And I think that's like the biggest kidnapping of the soul, <laughs> if you will. Like it, it really just kind of holds people in this position where they're like, I can't agree with that, but I have to agree with it. Like it's in this part. It creates it. I actually believe it creates mental illness like mm -hmm. exactly. me down this rabbit hole i actually believe that um islam is creating mental illness in my people so what's happening especially in the west we've already had a civil war these people are traumatized for other reasons they've had a civil war over tribal issues they come to the west right um you know the men themselves have obviously um because islam allows them to marry four women and the men themselves are traumatized themselves, have got issues, you know, they might have be struggling to get jobs themselves. They might feel emasculated in this Western society, you know. So then they take that frustration out on their women. So it's either they're either abusing the women physically, and that's justified in Islam, or they will just abandon that family altogether. Because a lot of the men, and it's like everybody's a victim in this situation because the men just feel pressure. They don't know where they fit in the society. They Their kids are just like going left, right. So they're probably just thinking, Maybe it's this wife, you know what I mean? Let me just get a new wife. They've, they've got depression and anxiety and PTSD themselves. They're like, let me just go back home and maybe marry a new woman. It's, it's halal for me, you know? So again, it's not the men's fault, you know? Islam allows it. Let me just go back to, you know, get another wife, see how it goes. They they try other they try, they, yeah, they try to remedy mental illness through the Problems. <laughs> right. Not only through the Quran, but also through actions. Like, for example, they're like, let me go marry a younger, more pretty wife. Maybe that will cure my depression. Do you get what I'm saying? A lot of these men are depressed as well, too. So then that doesn't work. And then meanwhile, back at the ranch, you know, your first wife has, is having a nervous breakdown and the children there are abandoned. So they're, you know, um, now at Black Lives Matter process. But you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You see, it's a flow on effect. You know what I'm saying? The whole community is like... Um, yeah 
seriously in and, and the women and and the reason why it causes mental illness is because the woman is like this, wearing this jibab, this covering, you know, she's mm. trying to cover, she's trying to be the best pious woman and she's seeing her, her life falling apart. You know, her man's off married, a, mm. a younger woman. Yeah. Um, she's, she might have been abused and that's justified. Um, her children are off in this Western world. She doesn't fit. She can't make friends with the Jennifer across the road. She can't understand her, you know, so she's like trapped. You start talking to yourself and in that starting to talk to yourself, that's where the mental health issues begin, you know? So I, I, yeah. I was going to say, isn't that related to um, kind of becoming, a, you know, like getting getting involved in society, speaking the language and, um, you know, integration, yeah, yeah, integration. Assimilation. Assimilation. But, but if you become, if you have a religion that teaches you Catholics um, um, are not to be trusted, never be friend, I think there's a verse that says never befriend a non-Muslim. Mm. Yeah, you know, so. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if when you put, when you put in a position of being supreme, um, I remember coming to this country and feeling and thinking I'm better, right? <laughs> and never, never really pausing to 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 for one second saying, "Well, then why am I coming here? Why aren't they coming to me?" Right? If I'm so great. But the thing is, this built-in arrogance comes through even if you're coming to another country. Right, so that's why you're going to see a lack of assimilation. That's why you'll see a lack. Of yeah, because Allah gave them the visa, not Jenna. Yeah. it wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah, it was Allah. It was Allah that gave them. It wasn't the UN. It wasn't yeah. the UN. It wasn't Sweden that actually approved the visa. It was Allah and my du'a in the refugee camp that helped me get to this Western world. I mean, these Westerners are just, just yeah. facilitating just Allah's will. Yeah, they're, they're facilitating off. Allah's will. You know? So, so we're talking here about specifically Somalis were coming to the West, were not immigrating based on wealth or job or anything. We're talking about people that are coming from troubled countries, war-torn country, like situations, uh, refugees, and what you're saying is they're not they're not assimilating well, and they're not they have a lot of mental health issues. Is that that's what you're saying? Yeah. Um, I, I would say it's like. You know, Okay, listen, these are resilient people. I don't want to put Somalis down to make it seem like they can't be helped and there is some, a lo like a lost cause. They're absolutely, like I'm from these same, you know, people. My genetics haven't changed. I always try to remind people I'm one generation <laughs> removed from the desert, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's not as if they don't have potential. It's just that they need tools, they need help. You know, I was lucky to be born in Australia. That's why I'm not as traumatized as my people. I do have, I feel as, as a, a secondhand trauma just from hearing their stories. But that being said, I feel as though if they were to, if the West um, had more thoughtful in, um, integration programs that, you know, took men the mental health of refugees into consideration, because a lot of these people are fleeing bombs and stuff like that. You know, for example, in my mum's case, like, you know, she's really traumatised over the way my grandfather was killed. He was killed in a bombing um, by Americans. You know, we couldn't find, my, like, my, brother, my grandfather's um, brains were scattered um, in a million different directions, you know? So this is my mum. They couldn't even get his boy together to bury him. So mm -hmm. my mother, she replays that over and over again, you know? Like her, her father was her hero. Like hero. It's very deep, you know what I mean, for people. So you can imagine people that have been gang raped in refugee camps or whatever. All this. So what I'm trying to say is you can't just let those people off a plane and be like, okay, here you go. Do some welfare and off you go. You know, they need programs. They need, to, they need help. You know, and it's incumbent on Westerners as well to to help them integrate. It's not about you know just blaming those refugees. You know, yeah. like it's incumbent on us to help them as yeah. well to. Because um, you'll see, you'll find um, Somalis in the whole spectrum. You'll find Somalis exactly on the liberal side, and you'll find Somalis the very rigorous side. Um, I think what we're trying to do um, with, with a project like Walk Nation, for example, one of the things that we're trying to do, and and, and I always say this to them too, is that when I say I'm an apostate or I don't believe in Islam and things like that, they'll say, then you're not Somali. Because there's this link that's always made with being Somali and being Muslim, right? And you'll hear that repeated oftentimes. 100% of Somalis are Muslim. Well, that means me and Noonan are part of that 100%, right? Yeah. So it's just literally, it's just not true, right? Because there's Christians. There's even a Somali clan that was uh, the, that were Hebrews and then and, and had Judaism, uh, but that was beaten out of them, uh, and they became Muslim because of obviously they wanted to, to live. What I tried, what, 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 what we oh, you cut off again. 
product uh, would work nation, I believe. One of the products. Can you hear me now? Can yep, you hear me? Go ahead. Yep. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yep. Sorry. Uh, so one of the one of the projects that we're trying to do is to you know when you say you're you no longer believe and they say well then you're not Somali, then I say well can we not say then that um, Islam is an Arabic religion and they'll say no Islam is for everyone. Yeah. So and you see where I'm going with this yeah. because what we're trying to do, what we're trying to do essentially and one of the things that we try to push is that we want to uncouple is Islam from Somaliness. The way yeah. they uncouple Islam from, you know, being Arab. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's a bigger project because as soon as our people are even, we're we're, we're very um, uh, pioneerish because we're just trying to have the conversation. We're literally just have trying to have the conversation because yeah. Islam and Somaliness are so intertwined that mm -hmm. we're trying to undo that and say, well, I'm still gonna re. So what has happened is that we fall back to our Somaliness, hence Walk Nation, hence what, what we portray to be as Somaliness and, and kind of re-embrace uh, the fact that we're from the Horn of Africa and we're people that existed prior to Islam and hopefully will exist after <laughs> Islam is gone. Absolutely. Uh, although I don't think Islam is going away anytime soon, we're definitely seeing no. a big change in the population and the demographics. And I want to ask you about that. Yeah. Before I do that, I want to tell everyone to check out Walk Nation. I have the link there in the chat and it's in the description as well. Thank uh, it's you. a podcast done by these two fellow, uh, beautiful souls here. Uh, so do check that oh, out. And, and some other guys too. Yes. Oh, okay. Guys so it's, it's, a, it's a bigger yeah, project than just you two. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. 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 And uh, for those of you who are new here to your friendly neighborhood ex-Muslims channel, please do consider joining. Mm -hmm. Click join now below. The money does help. Thank you very much. And if you are new here, you can also subscribe. You don't have to pay money. You're free to join as well just by subscribing. Thank you all. And uh, now let's get back to it. So what do yeah. you think is happening? So so we, we're talking a lot about Somali refugees. There's also, there's also mm -hmm. Somalis who are not refugees. Like I know in Kenya, mm -hmm. Some of the most mm -hmm. wealthy people are Somalis. Mm -hmm. Like my uncle lives mm -hmm. in Kenya and he was showing me these couple of buildings on his video that they own the whole building. Yeah. They're so rich and some of them, they come here and they're wealthy. So there's different types of people. Do you think even with the, the well-off Somalis that religion is still causing problems for them in their lives? And why, why would you say it is? I like, think religion just, again, creates its apathy and arrogance. Like, uh -huh. I just feel as though there are absolutely so many successful um, Somalis, shout out to them. And I actually am one of these people that I'm not, I don't talk about Somali issues. So um, other people can kind of look at Somalis and be like, oh my God, you know, yet another Somali <laughs> drama. Yeah. I actually do this so just to other, to talk to other diaspora people like myself that ha may have a little bit of resources, may have, you know, some contact, just to be like, help our, we have, we can help ourselves. You know, we can help our own communities. Um, we can lift ourselves out of whatever, you know? So um, yeah, going back to the whole, uh, you know, the religious, um, sorry, the wealthy Somalis, particularly in Kenya, in Tanzania, like, I just feel that, again, Islam creates this dynamic. I just look at Israel, for example, Israel, so I think 75 years ago, these people were in a camp, you know, mm. um, you know, being murdered, um, like, on, you know, by the millions, you know, um, what I was, was open. <coughs> so I, I, I just want to say, like, in 75 yeah. years, these people built a nation that we are now, we take notes from Israel when it comes to medical advancement, science, about all this stuff. So it can be done. Um, but I just feel for some reason, for the last 30 years, not much development has happened in Somalia. Mm -hmm. And that is because of, I believe, tribal culture that is reinforced by Islam. Because okay. I feel like if we didn't have Islam, we would have progressed. And Islam stops innovation. You know what I'm saying? And innovation of allowing for ideas and stuff like that. Ideas like, you know, nationalism, you know, you, like, all, you know, all of these ideas we could have borrowed. You, from the humanism, Islam. veganism. Humanism, yeah, yeah, veganism, yeah. so many things. But we can't, we can't use any other idea but um, Islam. So I would, I would, I would also say, if on. I can um, say this, I, I think what we have to also understand is that socioeconomics do make it do make a difference. All right. So if you if if you're well off in socioeconomics, chances are um, you might not be holding on to something, uh, is it like a religion as That's much true. as you would if you were poor because you just have you know. When you're poor, that's you need hope, and I think that's what we're. Yep. 
Right? And the people that are the most zealous sometimes I feel are uh, lacking in socioeconomics. So to, I would say that, and you, you have to understand, like if you come from a you know a well-off place and, and well-off Somalis, you can at the very least have the conversation. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that you could at, at the very least have the conversation. Now, this is not a blanket statement. And it's really based on my experience. But when people are doing well for themselves, they can at least sit down and talk with you in confidence. Yes. But if they don't, if they don't, if they're not, and then if they're lacking or they're in poverty or abject poverty, you are insulting the the the, the their whole time. right? Yeah, because you know what. I, I've um sorry I'm interrupting you because hard to know when someone's done. Okay. Um it's it's religion and us in general, we are emotional beings first. And a lot of people don't realize that. A lot of people think we are rational beings first. One of the biggest insights I've got from reading this book, Everything is Fucked by Mark Manson. Beautiful book. I mean, it's really the guy writes it like 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 so chill. I mean, just from the title, you can see that. But the book was so profound because one of the biggest lessons I learned is that we are emotional beings first and rational beings second. We think we're rational Absolutely. beings. We think we're in charge. We think we're all logical and everything, but we're not. We're actually emotional. So, you know, frankly speaking, I mean, that's that's the situation. Now, because you do have to get going, I want to end off on something um, positive. Or it could be negative. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> so I want to ask you guys, both of you, mm -hmm. How is life now after leaving Islam? Like, obviously, I'm going to say before you answer that I do know, I do understand that sometimes when you leave Islam, there's a bad phase you have to go through. Family members are not happy and, you know, struggles. Obviously, both of you are grown up. Um, like, you have kids of your own and everything, which is great. You're not living under someone else's roof. So you, you can do what you want. You're living in the West. These are all positive things. But, you know, not everyone has, you know, all of those blessings, right? So how, how are you doing right now? And do you have anything you want to say about that? Whoever wants to go first. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll get mine out of the way. But the thing, what, what I would say is that you're absolutely right. Um, and we're no, and by no means advocating for people that are uh, not free or uh, that are not independent, rather, uh, to be kind of yelling at the top of their lung. Um, we have to still be cognizant of that. That does exist. I have, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fully grown man. I have really no reason to be, um, you know, if, if I'm not exercising my free speech in a place where free speech is permitted, yeah. then, you know, what's, what, what, what's the point of even having it? Yeah. What I would say is that what I, personally, my, 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 my way of looking at it is that I want to just engage people in conversation. Because the thing is, even if minds are not changed, minds can still come together and come, come up with some sort of a, I'm a bit, I'm a bit of an optimist, but I, I really do believe that that's the way forward because Trying to make people believe things is I, I look at someone trying to uh, proselytize to me Islam when and a lot of times it's people that from that I know more of. I know more about Islam than these people talking to me about Islam. Oftentimes, I just want to be able to uh, to take the words of uh, XMNA, uh, normalize dissent, and to actually have these conversations. I just want to open up the bridges to have these conversations, and I believe that to be the way forward from uh, for my uh, Somali people, honestly. Beautiful. And and uh, would you say your life is better now as an ex-Muslim? I honestly, to be very very quite honest, um, if you're talking about outwardly, uh, nothing has really changed because <laughs> I was on that same yeah. path. Yeah. But internally, yes. Yeah. Internally, I am able to follow. I am able to have the courage to follow my curiosity. I'll put it like that. Beautiful, beautiful. And how about you, Noon? Um, I just want to finish my original thought, which okay. was I'm not an activist. I'm not an activist, and I'm just like a victim of the culture, really. Um, I just want to say I don't. I'm not an activist. I'm nobody's prophet. You know, I'm nobody's leader. Don't be messaging me nothing. You know, I'm just speaking for myself as an individual. No, I have to really, I have to stress this because some dickhead from Pakistan or Somali or something is going to message me. So I got to clarify that. All right, I'm nobody's prophet. Um, I'm just here to say that I'm, like I said, I'm like, just happen to be a Western-born girl that just happens to deal with honor and um, shame culture in a Western context. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, that's that's really all I got to say. Well, and and uh, would you say that your life is better now after leaving Islam? Um, like I said, on the ex how, with my dealings with how I deal with people, I'll say no. Um, being a Muslim was much easier because 
I, I had a lot less judgment. Everybody thought of me as a victim. You know, I feel as though, particularly now that I am um, an ex-Muslim and especially as a black woman, um, it's very, I'm very inconvenient for a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know, especially in the social state of Victoria, which I live in Australia. Um, these hipsters, they, um, being an ex-Muslim, honestly, God has been exhausting for me. You don't know how much, how challenging, how much backlash I've received from the Australian um, left-wing community, um, just because I won't, I won't allow them to victimize me. And at the same time, I just receive abuse from my community, and I'm not protected from that. So no, my safety is not. I, I don't feel. But in my spirit and in my soul. I'm free, you know, in my mind, I'm free. You know, when I go to sleep at night, I sleep really good, let me tell you. When I laugh, I laugh for my soul. That's something that I never felt as a Muslim. So shout out to anybody that doesn't like me, but that's something that you'll never be able to take. Okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, anyway. <laughs> more, more of a shout out to the to the people that are actually like-minded, because um, that's, I think, what we need to cultivate, is be, to kind of have people, uh, these kinds of gatherings of the mind uh, from all walks of life and all types of uh, different things, and talk about how Islam affected us, and to at least open up the conversations. Maybe that way, uh, freedom writers won't be hacked to death in uh, you know around the world. <laughs> I know. Shout, out to, shout out to the women of Iran. Shout out yeah. to the honest to God. Shout out to the women of Iran. Every time I feel down about being an expert, especially when these, you know, especially when these Westerners, you know, malign me. Because believe it or not, actually, I, a lot of Muslim women silently support me, or they understand my thinking because they understand this culture. You know what I mean? They might not like the things that I say openly, but they get it. You know what I mean? So they won't say nothing to me. But it's these Westerners that um, social justice warriors. Believe it or not, black, white. I've even had Asian people, people that have never been Muslim in their life. They're the worst people on earth. Um, like when it comes to this issue, you know, um, about silencing us. So Wow. Yeah. I, I haven't had as much. It seems like you've had a lot more backlash than me. I've only once or twice. Yeah, had sort of, this is on and like what happened? You want to give an example? I was going to say, I think it's because I'm black. I think it's because I'm black <laughs> and a woman. And no, no, I really didn't you know. I, I really hate to use. I'm the last person to use yeah. the black card, but I really do think it offends people that I feel like I'm the captain of my own destiny. People are like, how dare you? You know, people are like, you should be a victim. I'm like, I'm not oh, a victim, bitch. Yeah. Like, so that attitude itself, that attitude offends these people because they want to pat me on their head like their little puppy and tell me that I'm a victim, you know? Yeah. So the fact that I'm, I, I, I have the audacity to self-actualize, believe it or not, is offensive. To, it's political and it's offensive because I'm a black woman. So that's a whole other conversation for another day. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I want to thank you guys for, for coming. And I know uh, you have to get going, uh, Khan. And so, and uh, yeah, definitely appreciate you guys coming on here. And, um, you know, <laughs> so like you said, we got to, we, we have to. Talk so to people. Yeah, no problem. Um, and you guys do, everyone in the chat and uh, whoever's watching this later, do check out Walk Nation, uh, the podcast. Um, it's it's going to be big. It's going to be so big after this show goes live. You're going to see. Oh, my uh, God. You want to grow it. And especially, and, and it's in English, right? So it's not. Yeah, yeah it's in English. I'm, English. I'm almost like scared of the cloud. We, but, we, um, we're trying okay. to get some uh, Somali content as well, just to uh -huh. kind of uh, appeal yeah. to uh, different uh, demographics within the Somali community, of course. Um Somali. But, but 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 mainly is um, for uh, diaspora Somalis, right? Uh, the whole Somali. And there's many of us, just to clarify. Yeah, there's, there's a many of us. So you're gonna yeah. see different different faces, different names, you know. Definitely, I'm always uh, happy Absolutely. to support uh, my fellow uh, YouTubers there. And I know you're not activist. Okay. You know, I know you said that you're not activist, but I'm not an activist exactly. It's gonna be fair. <laughs> Whatever you Otherwise, are. You understand? If you these people are gonna come after you, you know, they're yeah. like, yeah. So anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I do, I do feel as well. I don't know what it is. I mean, we don't have time now to talk about it. But if you're a woman, it's much worse. I've seen that from other ex-Muslim yeah, women, yeah. Uh, Zela K, and you know, like you said yourself, they yeah, just yeah. The brunt of the abuse. Uh, these, these men, uh, I mean, these, these uh, abusers are wimps, the cowards, they're picking on women all the time. I mean, they don't come to Always. me. They, they want to pick on. You know, I they don't. Get women as well too. Oh, yeah. I, would get, like, I would get death threats from women. I would get death threats from men, sorry, and, and like abuse threats and like race yeah, threats. Crazy. And then I would get Muslim women, believe it or not, telling me to kill them myself. And then I would get white women, like white lefty, me, these people that have got Black Lives Matter in there, right, <laughs> literally, sending me messages. Like I remember this one woman named Elizabeth, wherever you are, Elizabeth in France, I'm going to whoop your ass one of these days. But anyway, um, this Elizabeth, she Don't was like, oh, you're Australian. No, 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 I'm not. <laughs> yeah, anyway, whatever. Um, 
what was he gonna say? She was like, you're Australian. She goes, Australia doesn't want you. She goes, you're, she's literally told me I'm a nigger. Like this is a person with Black Lives Matter in their uh, thing. She went back and forth with me saying to me that, you know, I was unwanted in Australia. I'm like, mate, they want my taxes, mate. I'm very wanted. Like, so she was, she, <laughs> anyway, she was like belittling me and stuff like that. But it's that kind of constant, you know, know your place as a brown person yeah. and it's beneath us, you know, <laughs> anyway. Oh my God. Okay. Well, uh, we'll end on that. Yeah. So, uh, Elizabeth, okay. you, you need to, you should apologize for that. That wasn't watch really out. nice. You watch out. And, um, uh, yeah. And, uh, thank you guys again. And, uh, yeah, thank oh. you, Abdullah, for having us. Uh, on thank the you so much for having us. Okay. Thank you so much. Take care, guys. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye. Okay.